Hello, welcome or welcome back. My name is Ari and this is my 1960s wrap up. So I don't know how I feel about the 60s. I feel like I read a bunch of very mediocre books for the 1960s. There were a couple that I absolutely hated and were atrocious, and then there was a couple that I really really loved. One of those was cheating because it was a reread of a five star, but let's just jump right into it. First up for 1961 is James and the Giant Peach by Roald Dahl. This is a very, very basic children's story um, with a quickly moving plot point because you, you gotta keep the children's interested. What is with my hair? But I mean, it's a children's story, you gotta keep the kids interested so it just moves from like plot point to plot point. Conflict resolution, conflict resolution, conflict resolution. That That's what children's books do. Um, it was about a young boy named James, because it's James and the Giant Peach. His parents were killed in a freak rhinoceros accident. <laughs> and he was left orphaned and sent to live with his two evil aunts. And he leads a miserable slave-like life until a man shows up with glowing green, green worms tells him that he needs to mix the worms in water and drink it and then he'll have a great life. And as he is running into the house to get a glass of water to put the worms in, he trips and drops the worms into the ground next to a peach tree. And adventures ensue from there with a happy ending at the end. This got three stars because it was fine. I'm, I'm a little old for it, but mostly what I rate my children's books on is would I recommend parents to allow their children to read these books? And in this case the answer is yes. There's no weird racism, the deaths are so absurd that it's not going to like emotionally traumatize a child. Speaking of emotional trauma, for 1962 I read A Clockwork Orange by Anthony Burgess, and yikes. <laughs> the writing in this book uses a lot of like made-up slang, which kind of does two different things in my opinion. First off, it like softens the harder aspects of the story. Um, so you have to like, you're not directly confronted with he gang raped this woman until she was killed, which is a very blunt thing to read. You instead get like this jumble of slaying where you have to be like, wait, did what I think happened just actually happened? Um, it also makes the story really freaking hard to follow because it's just brand new vocabulary that you have, you're just thrown in like you're supposed to understand it, but you kind of have to like figure it out through context clues. So you miss a lot of the story or you have to like pause and think about the context of each sentence or paragraph to figure out what the F these random slang words mean. There is a lot of rape in this book. Like, I already mentioned that he and his buddies literally at one point in this book broke into these people's house, beat the shit out of the husband, and gang raped a woman until she died. Like, that is just a subplot of this book. He also, oh, the main characters of this book are like 15. <laughs> like, 15 year old boys did this. Uh, and then he also rapes two 10 year old girls. Does it make it better that he's 15 and he did this? Or does it not? I think no. Basically all of that sets up that this guy is 
a horrible human being who needs to be institutionalized and fixed, which is kind of the point of the story. Um, he is institutionalized and psychiatrically given a cure to fix him, and then the book questions, like, even if this person is that horrible, does the government still have a right to take the horribleness of them away? I think if you're gonna gang rape somebody until they die, uh, we can just ship you to a desert island and then light the island on fire. Uh, I gave this three stars because it was actually like a very interesting story. Um, it was readable, paced well. I was just kind of like horrified by the things that happened, but they didn't happen without purpose. Um, I usually dock off stars if there are things that happen, um, like rape, that don't have a purpose to the story. This very, very clearly had a purpose in this story, is to set up how just truly evil a character this guy was. Um, it did... the ending did kind of lose some points for me. They had an epilogue type thing added later. Um, that's supposed to like tie everything up in a neat bow. I didn't like the epilogue part that but I didn't take off a star rating for it because it wasn't originally in the story. It was added later. Next up for 1963 was Planet of the Apes by Pierre Bo Bollet. Bollet? It's French, that sounds right. This is sci-fi. Basically, three men go into a spaceship and travel randomly into space and sh end up on a planet where apes are the intelligent creatures, but humans... and humans are like bestial animal-like. The apes are ma doing science experiments, um, and they need humans to do this animal testing, so the three spacemen end up being captured and used for science experiments. Um, and you follow, like, the main uh, nar narrator, Ulysses, and you don't really follow the other two guys. They're just kind of side stories that aren't particularly relevant, so you just really follow the science experiments of Ulysses, who although he doesn't speak the same language as the apes, he tries to um, demonstrate to them that he is an intelligent being and he is unlike all of the other humans who are just animalistic. Ulysses is kind of an idiot and he seems to think that performing like a dog is going to come across as an intelligent being. Uh, <laughs> he like does like tricks that, a, that you could train a dog to do and it takes a very long time for people to take him seriously because it's just like is this a really intelligent animal or like like a dog or is there actual like human intelligence sentient intelligence there <laughs> the uh, moral or the purpose of this story is that cisgendered white men are better than everything else. <laughs> like that's really like the entire point is like Ulysses is somehow better than all of the apes because he is a white man. Like they even like say in this book that he is a superior being because he is a white man. <laughs> so there's like these weird overtures to racism with apes and then the white man's supposed to be better than the apes. Uh, also, like the science in this is so wonky. Like apparently if you are treated like an animal, then you will lose any ability to think for yourself. Like one of the characters 
is put in a zoo and he becomes bestial. Like, this is like a 50 year old man who spends like less than two years in a zoo and he is never again in his entire life able to regain any sense of intelligence. <laughs> it's just, it's really weird. Um, but just to imply that if men spent time, like, not using their intelligence will suddenly lose it. Um, also, the apes are not as intelligent as humans because they're, like, stuck. Like, it's been 10,000 years since the last human died, or the last intelligent human existed in their society, and they've not invented anything new in that 10,000 years. Like, they're able to maintain, but because they're not human, they're no longer able to progress. It's just maintain. I have it on here that this is three stars, but this is really a two star book. Um, I might have to go back and change my Goodreads or maybe I wrote it down here wrong, but this is really just not good. Um, I didn't particularly like the movies either, even though the movies are way different. There's no war in this like there is in the movies. Next up for 1964 is The Penultimate Truth by Philip K. Dick. This is so boring. <laughs> like, oh my gosh, this took me, it's, it's not even like 300 pages and it took me so long to read because I was so bored. Uh, basically, humanity uh, World War III happens and humanity has fled to underground bunkers to survive and they're all crammed together and uh, tiny quarters and they just have to create robots and the robots fight their wars and it's been like 15 years since the war started. Um, it turns out that the war ended after like two years and a bunch of rich men just took over hundreds of acres each and they live above ground on these like vast mansions and they just create um, propaganda that they video stream into the bunkers to like fake that the war's still going on and letting them have like all the space that they need and then the robots that they're making in the underground bunkers are just used as uh, like servants for the wealthy men who live above ground and I don't <laughs> this is a mess of a book there's like all this random shit about time travel it, it's like subplots and side plots that don't fit with anything else. We've got time travel, you've got like uh, organ, like mechanical body parts that will help you live longer, that are being hoarded by wealthy elite. Uh, it, I don't know why they can't be manufactured anymore, but apparently they can't be manufactured anymore. Um, You've got, like, random characters who are immortal for no apparent reason. Uh, like, that was never really explained. It, it was like, he's Cherokee, so he's immortal. <laughs> and then, like, as you look at him, he, like, ages and then gets younger and then ages and gets younger and his wife and kids do the same. It was, it's weird. Uh, but yeah, it didn't make sense and it was boring, so. Not anything at all like Fallout. Next up for 1965 was Dune by Frank Herbert. And I love this book. This was a four star book for me. I actually read this whole damn thing in like two days. This is so interesting to me. This is, it's a very like religious overtones in, in this book. Um, 
the main character Paul is a chosen one trope, like this is the... I guess it's not the chosen one trope, I guess that was probably Tolkien, but this is a chosen one trope where Paul is destined to be the savior of humanity uh, and he like grows up knowing that I guess. Um, he is the only man who can use these like mind magical abilities out of like a society of women magicians. Uh, and he was he was born his mother is one of these like magical ladies uh, I guess they can like read thoughts and then in control people with their mind um, and she was supposed to have a daughter but her husband wanted a son so she had a son and then he's the chosen one and uh, the planet that this takes place on known as Dune it, it has another name that I can't remember um, but it has a substance like all throughout the planet called spice and spice is an addictive drug um, but is also the thing used to power like interstellar transportation so like if you control this planet and the spice on this planet you are like one of the most powerful beings in the universe but if you live on this planet and you're not one of those wealthy people trying to control the spice the most precious resource is water because this is an entire desert planet and finding water is nearly impossible so water to the native inhabitants of this planet is the most precious resource in existence and it's just it's an epic sci-fi so explaining all of it would take days just if you like sci-fi read it if you like sci-fi and you haven't read this book then you're weird like me but just read it next up for 1966 I reread Valley of the Dolls by Jacqueline Susan this is one of my all-time favorite books continues to be a five star I forgot to say Dune was a four star continues to be a five star this time when I read it I tabbed it and I don't know how well you can see these tabs but you might be able to tell that there's not a whole lot of tabs in the first half of this book and that's because this has a lot of buildup. It's a very very slow start. I think chapter one is 163 pages if that tells you how much of a slow start this book is. So what I have tabbed here, all of the tabs have relevant colors. The orange tabs are like major plots in Anne's life. The yellowy tabs are major plots in Jennifer's life. And the purple tabs are major plots in Nellie's life. The blue tabs are the drugs. So not every time somebody does a drug, but like significance like the first time that person uses drugs the first time or when they start increasing their drug use start taking like above the recommended prescription um every time they use a new drug just significant drug use um and yeah it's a lot of drug use it's about like how being a celebrity can suck for some people and how <laughs> how everybody's life no matter how rich you are kind of ends up sucking anyway that's why I like this it has it's a depressing book like nothing good happens it has a horrible ending for every single one of the main characters it's just a, a depressing book which is my thing um, Anne is like the clean-cut New England girl. Then you have Jennifer who is a... she's gorgeous and she's sweet and she's street smart. Um, 
but she undervalues her own worth and thinks that the only thing she has going for her is her looks. Um, she's also one of those people who has been so poor all of her life that she, or in, she's been controlled her entire life through money that she like instinctively just spends money. She panics and can't seem to like save her money and so she continues to be controlled by money because she's so afraid of not having money. Uh, it's weird. And then you have Nelly, who uh, divas out. Like, <sighs> Nelly cannot control her shit. Nelly is my least favorite character. Jennifer is my favorite. Anne's kind of in the middle. But there you go. Valley of the Dolls. Uh, this has got like 80 trillion different trigger warnings is definitely not for anybody or not for everybody but if you like books with sad endings like I do check this one out. Next up for 1967 I read 100 Years of Solitude by Gabriel Garcia Marquez and this is like the life through death of a family where uh, the father and mother of this family leave their home with a group of other people and found a village. Uh, I don't even know where this takes place. <laughs> it's like magical realism, uh, so it, it's very hard to pinpoint like exactly where in the world they are. It's either Spain or South America because they speak Spanish, but they found this village and it's basically like the founding of this village to the eventual complete destruction and death of this village through the eyes of this particular family and I'm not gonna give you any names because like everybody is named after each other in this book there's like 30 men with the same name <laughs> but it's told in a way of like fairy tales where or like mythology, I guess would be the the way to put it, where things are happen, things happen, and then they're explained in like a mystical way. In each chapter is like one of these tales. So you get like a girl who disappears, and the story is she grabs onto a balloon and floats into the into God only knows where and no, she's never seen again instead of her just vanishing into the jungle which is probably what would have happened. Um, you have a man who dies and his mother's the one who finds his body but it can't be that simple. It's he's shot through the head and as he falls to the floor and the blood starts draining out of his head it goes out of his house, down the street, into his mother's house, but it avoids the rug because you don't want to stain the rug, it creeps all the way around the room and then comes to the feet of his mother and she looks down and sees the blood, follows the path, and then finds her son who's been shot in the head. Um, and it's just things like that. Overall, I don't like magical realism and I don't like contemporary so this wasn't really for me but I can see why so many people did like this book. Um, the only thing I have to say is names confusing. 1968 I read Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep again by Philip K. Dick. While this was also confusing it was much much better than the penultimate truth. This was the book that inspired Blade Runner and if you remember Blade Runner was a really really weird movie <laughs> and it continue and it, it's also a really really weird book. Um, the a thing that you don't really get in the movie that makes more sense in the book with like the titles like Do Androids Dream of Electric Sheep, um, it's Earth is uninhabitable, um, it's poisonous basically to anybody who lives there, but there's still people who live there and they're... they hate androids. <laughs> 
all the other like colonies on Mars and the moon are fine with androids but androids like not allowed on earth and there's bounty hunters who are specifically designed to hunt down and kill androids and that's what Richard Decker does um, he is a bounty hunter but the people who do live on earth uh, and there's very very few of them are they're obsessed with owning animals because that is like a sign of affluence is to be able to own an animal because no real animals exist anymore on earth so Deckard owns a electric and android sheep that is meant to resemble a real sheep but he knows it's an android and he dreams of being able to own a real animal not necessarily a sheep just a real farm animal so this book was a wild ride as seems to be a trend with philip k dick's books uh i for the majority of it preferred the movie to the book but the book did a better job of explaining the situations that are happening uh, it's just probably because of time constraints but like motivations and different things like that you're just like why is this even happening in in the when you're watching the movie but it makes a whole lot more sense when you read the book there's a lot of weird allegory throughout this book about like human nature loneliness what it means to be human um things like that it was okay i gave it a three star next up is the other jacqueline susan book i read this month and that is the love machine uh this is the sequel to valley of the dolls but there's there's no even vague crossover there's no characters that cross over the setting is completely different all of that fun stuff uh this book is basically about robin and his inability to fall in love with a woman and to like feel comfortable in a relationship uh he he's incapable of emotional attachment to a woman there's three sections in it and each of the sections is named after a woman who falls in love with robin there is a big spoiler in or i guess i'm not going to tell you what it is but there is a big reveal in the book of why robin has like this emotion like inability to form emotional attachments um it's it's very old school like freudian psychology bullshit that probably wouldn't work it today and there's a bunch of really really sad parts to this book uh as Jacqueline Susan is wont to do it's not is there, there's not like drug addiction well there's like minor drug addictions but nothing like Valley of the Dolls this is more of like emotional dependency type issues and neg negativities trigger warnings for homosexuality there are quite a few gay men in this book and the majority of the characters are just enormously cruel to them uh, which is historically accurate so you have to take that into account robin on the other hand is interestingly progressive he still uses terms that aren't appropriate in modern times but they would have been fine at the time and he shows fantastic kindness towards both homosexual men and trans women uh, there is a young queer boy who takes care of robin's aging and dying mother and um the initial thought is because she's a wealthy woman is that he's like taking advantage of her but once robin finds out that the like boy actually like legitimately cares for her as like a friend and a companion um robin gets like really cool with him he makes sure that he gets part of 
his inheritance once his mother dies he just treats him kind of like a bro like he's nicer to him than he is to most of the women in this book um and just kind of like hangs out with him and he's like do you have a thing for me and at first the boy does and then eventually he's like no i'm not interested in you and he and he gets like kind of offended and then the boy's like not everybody has to, just because I'm gay doesn't mean I have to be attracted to you and he's like you know what that's a really good freaking point <laughs> additionally and this is kind of a spoiler but it's not a major plot point in the book but Robin has an affair with a trans woman um like a, a one night stand type of an affair and he doesn't realize that she is trans um even though he meets her in a drag club, Robin doesn't realize it's a drag club, um, but the trans woman doesn't say anything about it because it's like, you met me in a drag club, obviously you know I'm trans, uh, and doesn't realize until after they've had sex that, oh my god, this straight man thinks I'm a biological woman, um, and post-op trans, no male parts. <laughs> I don't know how to like eloquently explain that but she has a vagina. It was just medically created. It's still a vagina. Um, but Robin is awesome about it. He doesn't treat her well but he does treat her like he treats every other woman in the book. So while he's kind of a jackass, it's equal opportunity jackass, and he asks some like very intelligent questions trying to like just educate himself about being a trans woman. And he was like, huh, that's really cool. And then he like throws some money at her and is like, buy you something nice, doll. I mean, like, he's a womanizer and he's an asshole to women. So it's it's one of those really weird parallels where it was written in the 1960s and it was extremely progressive for the 1960s. And even, like, parts of it are progressive for now, like, modern times, but it also has, like, terminology and misogyny that is not okay now. So while it's like great trans rep, it's also like horrible rep at the same time. And I've been like struggling with that because it, it's honestly, as far as like treating this trans woman like a fucking woman, which seems so hard to do for most people right now, he does like the rep for that is amazing it's just like this is another person just treat them like a fucking human being but as far as like the queer slurs and like just general misogyny it's not great <laughs> overall i gave this a four stars because it had a happy ending and i don't like happy endings they should have ended it on the negative turn. Her Jacqueline Susan failed me on the second book with giving me a happy ending, but we'll see for the 1970s if I get a sad ending. Next up for 1970 was Ringworld by Larry uh, Niven, I think is his name, and holy shit. What the fuck <laughs> this is like I don't, I don't even know this is like like incel misogyny trash <laughs> I have like this is so like backward like it wasn't even like acceptable in the 1970s that's how like unprogressive this novel was um it involves a weird age gap romance where one of the characters is 200 years old and the other is 20. um 
The 20 year old is a female, of course, and she is vapidly stupid. Uh, her entire purpose, um, and we are actually in this book told that her entire purpose is for the main character to have sex. He meets a 20 year old girl, takes her on a like space travel. <laughs> he, he takes her with him on a spaceship to a, a ring world uh, thousands of millions of light years away to explore this ring world uh, because he needs somebody to fuck while he's away from home. Like I'm not even kidding, that's her entire purpose. The other species, alien species that are traveling with them, um, the females are non-sentient and they're only used for breeding. So they don't need them for sex because they don't enjoy sex. The females are just to breed. Tila is the female main character's name. Uh, not only is she taken to this ring world specifically to be a walking, talking sex toy for our main protagonist, who is one of those guys that's like, I'm a white male, so I solve everything. <laughs> he's, he's one of those characters. But on this planet, our main character, I don't even think I wrote his name down. Yeah, I didn't even write his name down. That's how irrelevant and so bland and basic he was. But he uh, eventually finds a another human on the ring world. This ring world has kind of been like destroyed and abandoned and there's only like a very small handful of sentient beings, sentient human-like beings left on the planet, but one of them is a female prostitute. And at this point, the main character decides that he doesn't need Tila anymore. He has this new prostitute who is like a thousand years old, so she is perfected sex and because the plot of the story no longer requires Tila as uh, for his sexual desires he's got a replacement it delivers us a <laughs> a romantic interest for Tila but because he's an alien he doesn't understand that females can be powered too, or can be powerful too, and thinks that Tila belongs to this main character who's trying to get rid of her now. And um, so she agrees to be sold as a sex slave so she can fall in love with this man and stay on the ring world. <laughs> because it's her destiny to be this dude's sex slave. <laughs> this book was so trash. This was literally like some guy had some weird alien sex, like wet dream. It's it's some like teenage boy's alien wet dream where he puts himself in the male character, saves the day, and gets all the pussy in the world. <laughs> but yeah, this one got two stars. And thank god that is it for the 1960s. I hope <laughs> I hope I have a little bit less misogyny in the 1970s but I'm not really planning on it um, but that video is already up my TBR for the 1970s so I will link it up there I think and I will see you in the next video